Good morning. Welcome to St. John St. James. This is Palm Sunday. We're continuing that sermon series on Sunday mornings during the Lent of rethinking religion. Today, we're rethinking real strength. We'll make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The children will be singing in the second service, and so we'll continue with our opening hymn, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. We join together in song. I'll invite those who are able to stand. We pray. Merciful Father, Jesus rode into Jerusalem not as a conquering king, but in humility, the servant king, ready to complete the task for which you had sent him. You are mindful that we are mindful that you ask us also to serve you and submit to you as our Savior Jesus did. Forgive us for the times we do not love you or our neighbors, as we should. Forgive us for those times we think too highly of ourselves and follow our own way. We take off our cloaks of self-righteousness and lay them at your feet, we pray. Lord, we humbly come to you to confess our sin and to seek your forgiveness. We ask for your mercy in your Son's name. Amen. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We thank you for your tender love towards us, Lord. You sent your only Son, who is our Savior, Christ. He made the greatest possible sacrifice for us. Jesus had to die on the cross to save us from our sins. We pray to follow the example of his humility and patience. Your Son, Christ, reigns and lives with you forever. 
Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. We praise you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. As he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palm in his path, so may we always hail him as our King and follow him with perfect confidence, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. God foresaw and promised this entry into Jerusalem this last Sunday of our Lord Jesus. We hear of it in Zechariah chapter 9. We'll begin with verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim, the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue our worship with our psalm of the day. We join in singing Psalm 24.
We got there. Would you please stand? Let's, let's uh, listen to the gospel lesson for today. We'll give our attention to Mark chapter 11, the first 11 verses. We'll hear the account from Mark of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street tied at a doorway, and as they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered, as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches that they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Our worship continues with our hymn of the day. You may be seated. In the name of our crucified and risen Lord, amen. We'll give our attention to the epistle lesson appointed for today from Hebrews chapter 12. We'll look at the first three verses. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So far the word. 
Let's begin our time in the Word and prayer. Will you join me in your hearts? Lord Jesus, we desire to fix our eyes on you. We'd ask that you'd be with us and help us to better understand it. As we rethink religion today, help us to better understand real strength as we see it in your life and help us to see it in ours too. We ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, who's stronger? We could debate. Is it the one that's got those big, pretty, buffed up muscles? Is it the one who can pick up all that weight? We could go back and forth about who's stronger, but in the end, I'd guess that both, that we would say they're both strong. When we think of strength, that's what we think of, right? Muscle bound and being able to pick things up. Today we're going to look at Jesus and we're going to look at strength in a little different way. Even if we looked at Jesus as strength, we see him coming into Jerusalem that last time. If you'd compare him to what people saw during Jesus' time, the one that would look stronger to most people would have been the one that came all dressed up with the regalia and had the armies behind him riding in a chariot or on a big stallion. Not a scrubby little donkey with your feet almost scraping the ground as you rode along. From an outward perspective, Jesus was not a picture of strength on Palm Sunday. And yet today we're going to rethink that and look at what real strength is as we look at Jesus on Palm Sunday. And we'll specifically look at our text. It doesn't really talk at all about Palm Sunday, but it talks about what Jesus did and came to do that Holy Week. And so we're going to rethink real strength today and see that real strength follows the course. It is focused. It avoids hindrances. And that strength in the end perseveres. Our text says, therefore, and if you read the Greek, it says it like three different ways, like, whoop, we're getting to the end. And in fact, that's what we are at. With Hebrews chapter 12, we're in the last chapter. It's been building, this whole book has been building to this point and this idea to, for us to hammer it home. And it's coming off of chapter 11, the heroes of faith that we'll hear about in a little bit, as it starts to say, here's the whole point of this book. And as the point gets made, what we see is that the writer develops this idea of a race. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And I think we understand the idea of a race, right? Whether the race the whole time you have to run in the lanes that you're in or after a while you get to collapse and just whoever's in front gets to just run in the middle, however it works in the end, the race is always marked out, right? You don't get to go wherever you want to. There's a starting line, there's a distance that you go, and there's a finish line. And so God uses this picture of a race that's marked out where you're supposed to go and follow for you and I to think about our race of faith. God started us on that race a long time ago, probably when we were infants for most of us, when we were baptized, and we started that race, and we're still here, we're still running, because we haven't crossed the finish line yet. We haven't got home to heaven. But that's the picture that is going to be used in our text today of a race. And we're told that there's a, because we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And so the, the, the Greek here, again, is sort of making this picture of something that would have been familiar to them and is familiar to us, right? That there's a race, but there's also people who are watching it, who are cheering them on and encouraging them. The, the, church in the New Testament used this picture of the race that's here and the cloud of witnesses as one as though they're watching. And you'll find a lot of art in church history that uh, pictures like this would be on like a ceiling somewhere. And it's the idea of all the saints that are up in heaven and they're all watching us. They're all looking down as we're running the race. It's a fun idea, isn't it? But that's not exactly the picture that God is giving us here. When you look at the descriptions of heaven, it doesn't say that the saints are all peeking over the clouds looking and watching what we're doing. Instead, those pictures in heaven are of the saints all facing the throne. They're all praising God. 
They're all praising the Lamb that was slain who now sits at the right hand of God and rules all things. The saints and the angels are there, not watching us, but praising God in heaven. And so the picture that he's giving us here is there's this great cloud of witnesses, all these heroes of faith that have gone before. Some we know from the pages of Scripture and were mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, and some of them maybe just you know, and I don't. A grandmother, your father, some of those saints that you watched walk their walk of faith and finish the course And whether it's the ones from the pages of Scripture or for the pages of your life, these great cloud of witnesses all say the same thing, and their message all mingles together like a cloud that reminds us of the importance of what we're doing and where we're going and the importance of staying the course and running with perseverance. Sometimes they teach us that lesson and encourage us by the wonderful way and example that they ran their race and sometimes by the mistakes they made and the way that they got lost. But in the end, they all have the same message of telling us just how important this race is and where we are going and what will happen when we finish, that we will be welcomed home to heaven. This great cloud of witnesses witnesses to us the privileged race and the important race that we are running. A little commercial break. I'm going to tell you about the Boundary Waters Canoe Area for a second. To northern Minnesota, if you can see on the top of that map, you can see the area that it's at. Actually, that's the forest around it, and then there's a little bit darker spot that is just the Boundary Water Canoe Area. And that Boundary Waters Canoe Area is really big. It's hard to tell on this map just how big it is, but it's 1.1 million acres. That's 1,700 square feet There's all kinds of lakes in it, some of them big, some of them small. They've counted them and they said there's 1,110 lakes just in this little area. That's, I think, how Minnesota got the 10,000 lakes all up in the corner. I don't know that for sure. But I do know this, that they also have estimated that there's 1,200 miles of canoe routes that run through the Boundary Waters. If you look at it from the sky, you kind of get, this is just a little snippet of one area of the Boundary Waters, but you get a sense of what it's like. There's these little lakes all dotted with these little islands all over the place. And if you look closely, if you can tell up there, some of them connect and some of them don't. Now, if you've ever been up there, it is really hard to find your way around. When you don't see it from the sky, you don't know where you're going. You don't know if this little piece of land next to you is a big island a little island that's just a little thread of something, or if it's miles and miles of land. You have no idea. You don't know if you go forward, like in this picture, if you go to the end, is that a dead end? Or does it go to the right or to the left, and there's more lake and another whole thing, or where does it go? It's really hard to find your way in the boundary waters. I've been up there a few times. I'm always scared. I never lead because I don't know, I have a hard time figuring out where I'm at in the map. But we've always found our way. Someone knew what they were doing. But it always makes me wonder, who figured this out? That canoe route that we're on, how do they know where it goes? They give a lot of credit to it, to the, to the, the voyagers, the French fur traders of the 1800s and you go up there and there's the Voyagers National Park and all these different things, right? And maybe if you can look at this, you can't see it very clearly, but this is just a little section of the Boundary Waters canoe area. There's big lakes and then all that blue that's just dotted all up there on there, someone figured that all out. They mapped all of it. And they mapped all those 1,200 miles of canoe routes to figure out how you can get through it and to get where you're going. This is just one little area. Here's the actual, the whole region and what it looks like. We give credit to those voyagers of the 1800s, but the truth is the people who really figured this out were the Native Americans who lived there for thousands of years. 
And they figured out when does it dead end and you actually have to get out of your canoe and carry it and portage it across to another one or if you can keep going and wind your way through and connect to the next one and the next one. It boggles my mind to think of what it took to figure this out and map it all out. We give credit to the fur traders and the settlers and the pioneers that came, but it took hundreds and maybe thousands of years to actually figure it out. As we run this race, the commercial's over and we come back to our text. This is the picture that God uses. He says, fix our eyes as we run the race on the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Jesus is the pioneer. He's the one who went ahead and forged the way and blazed the path of faith. When it boggles my mind to think of the boundary waters and how they figured out how it all goes and where to get where you want to go and map it and all those things, that's what the picture is of Jesus. The pioneer who blazed the path of faith and said, this is how you get from here on earth to heaven. He navigated the whole thing and he mapped it out and he marked the race for you and for me. The picture of the pioneer is one of blazing a path, as we said, or it's a picture of like a founder, like Judge George Reed. And if you don't know who that is, that's the guy that is Reedsville's named after. A founder, someone who came and purchased the land and surveyed the land and started to clear the land and set it up and said, put a stake in the ground, here's Reedsville. We even named our town after him, Reedsville. Jesus is the founder. He's the pioneer. He's the one who purchased it. He's the one who found it, and we name it after him. And what God is saying with this phrase, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, is Jesus is A to Z in our faith. He's the one who began it and mapped it and ran it and went ahead of us and figured it out and perfected it. He completed it and finished it for you and for me. And so our text even goes on and says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He perfected it. He finished it. He did it perfectly. The one who went ahead and blazed the trail showed us how you live life, how you live your faith, and how you get home to heaven. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life opened the way for you and me. And that's so important for us. As God uses this picture of of running the faith and running with perseverance and running the race marked out for us, we recognize it. We get so distracted. We get so entangled by sin. We wander here and we wander there and we don't run the path. We get lost as easy as it might be to get lost in the boundary waters. It's really easy for us to get lost here in this earth, to get lost in the race of faith. And too often we do. Too often we get tangled up in our ideas, in our wants. And we don't run the race. We don't run the right way. We don't press forward. We don't strive and struggle and exert ourselves. And it's why we need Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter, to blaze the way and to run it for us and to complete the race so that we can go to heaven, so that the finish line isn't hell, but it's by our God's side in heaven. And so God says as we run the race, we fix our eyes Not on the things that entangle in this world, but on Jesus. So that we can run the race marked up for us and follow him and understand what real strength is and then run with real strength. When Jesus was all done and he endured the cross and all the scorn and shame that came with it, he sat down at the right hand of God and now he watches over us. And he cheers us on and he says, this is the way. Darren, don't turn to the right. Turn to the left. You maybe can't see where we're going next. You don't know where the turn is heading, but go this way. Because he knows the way. And he says it to every one of us. And shouts to us from his word and says, this is the way to go. 
Look out for that. Go this way. Jesus perfected it. We talked about it last week from Hebrews. This is the picture that Hebrews keeps using. Once made perfect when Jesus finished his work of salvation, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, all who listen and follow and run the race marked out for them. So there's the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, ruling in heaven, watching over. Back to the boundary waters. 35 years ago, roughly, I got to go on a teen trip to the boundary waters with the ELCA church across town where I grew up. It wasn't much of a youth group trip, really. The pastor didn't do any devotions or group prayers or anything. We just went up to the Boundary Waters. I think he really liked the Boundary Waters, and he wanted his two teen daughters to go up there with their friends. And so they went on a trip, and I got invited along. It wasn't really a coincidence, but I was dating one of the pastor's daughters, which I think is in part why I got to go along. And so the youth group went up to the Boundary Waters, and there's one day that stands out for me. We started out, we broke camp, and breaking camp means you pick up everything. You pick up your tents, everything that you slept in, all of your clothes, all of your cooking utensils, all of your food, all everything. Everything that you have, you pack it all up, you put it in bags, you secure it to the canoe, you load the canoes up, and you go to the next place. And on this particular day, we went canoeing after we broke camp for about an hour, and then we got to one of those dead ends where you can't canoe anymore, and we had to portage. And so when, a, when you get to the portage, you have to stop, you unload all that stuff that you loaded up in all those bags, and you carry it. And this portage maybe was about a mile, so we carried all that stuff a mile to the other end, and then you have to go back, and you have to get the canoes and carry them all the way back, and then you load up the canoes again, and we went farther. And this was the biggest, longest day that we had when we were on our trip. And so we got back in the canoes, and we went, and it was a windy day. And when you're out in the middle of the lake and the wind's blowing right against you, it takes forever. You're just paddling and paddling and you feel like you're just sitting there and not making any, any progress. And then, because we're teenagers, we got to go paddle way over there and go look at that thing that was on that island and we have to go look over there at those rocks and we're jibber-jabbering and talking and it took forever to do the, I don't know, five miles or whatever it was that we had to canoe that day. We were finally all done and we made it to camp and we set up the tents and we gathered the firewood and we cooked the dinner and we started to clean it up and the pastor came out of his tent as we were just starting to discuss what we were going to do the rest of the evening. And he explained to us that this jacket that he wore every morning and when it got cool at night was a really important jacket to him. He had had it about as since he was about our age as teenagers, and he always brought it and wore it when he went up to the Boundary Waters. It was super sentimental and important to him. He looked through all of his stuff, and he couldn't find it. He was pretty sure it got left when we portaged. And so he said to the whole group, I want to go back and get this jacket that's so important to me. Would one of you come with me and help me get my jacket? And he gives his puppy dog eyes look to his daughters and they look away because they don't want to go. They don't want to miss the fun and they're worn out from the day. And he gives his puppy dog eyes to the rest of the group and he looks at them and says, please will anyone go? And I remember thinking this, I do not want to go. I go over to his house and I think he really likes to intimidate me. And he makes it really hard to go to his house. Every time I go to his house, he wears his clerical collar and walks around the house and tries to intimidate me and make me feel really weird that I'm dating his daughter. Everyone else is nice and this guy's mean to me. I do not want to go. But no one else wanted to go either. And I don't know how long it took, but I stopped thinking about why I didn't want to go and why I thought he was always mean to me. Instead, I just thought about it and went, I should go. He was kind enough to bring us on this trip. He was kind enough to let me go. He's asking for help, and if it were my jacket, I would want someone to help me. 
So I don't know how long it took, but I finally stepped forward and said, I'll go. It is the fastest I've ever canoed in my life. <laughs> there was no wind. There was no bags of any kind in the canoes. It was just two, I'll call myself a man, a young man at least, but there were just two men in there, and I'm in the front. I don't have to steer or anything, and this is what I thought. I am going to show him that I'm strong, and I paddled as hard as I could all the way back to that port. It's just hammered, and we flew, and we went right there. No dawdling, no conversation, no pit stops, just hammered all the way back to the portage. And we got there just as it started to turn dark. Good luck finding a camouflage coat in the forest at dusk. And we didn't find it. We walked the mile back and forth in the portage and looked all over and finally gave up and said, it's not here. And we hammered back as fast as we could and got home and everyone was asleep. And we still did that faster than the teens had gone one way that day. We went twice as far and twice as fast. And I tell this story for a couple reasons. One, I think of what the scriptures say here. For the joy set before him, Jesus went to the cross. He didn't sit there and go, boy, this is really going to be rotten. I don't want to do this. He thought about why he should do it and what it meant if he didn't do it. Like a young man who had every reason to go, I'm going to stick my head down like everybody else and hide. But instead of pouting and complaining and thinking about what was missed, just simply went, this is the right thing to do. And it's what God tells us to do when we run the race. To don't look at what we're missing and don't look at where we could be or what we think would be fun or where we don't want to go as God marks out a race for us, but instead to joyfully follow like Jesus did the path wherever it leads. And I tell you this story because what a difference it makes when you're not meandering all over the place and going against the wind and have a canoe that's loaded down with all this stuff. But you can just fly when you go right where you're supposed to be going and follow the route and you work with and exert yourself to just do what you're called to do, which is run the race. I will tell you, I don't once regret it. Whenever I look back and think of that time when I went in that canoe on that lonely ride with my ex-girlfriend's pastor dad, I don't ever go, I hate that I did that. Because it was the right thing to do. And while we talked about this before, we talked about that we should throw off everything that hinders and entangles us so easily, that sin and all the distractions. And we talked about this, that there's that cloud of witnesses that encourages us as we run the race. They are not watching up in heaven, but you know who is watching? The people we run with. You and I watch each other. That Elka pastor watched me. And it might just have been me and my perception, but he never wear his, we never wore his clerical collar again at his house when I visited after I did that trip. I thought maybe he was nicer. I'm not sure about that. But we watch each other. For a little bit of time, God said, I'm going to run that race with those people. Now God has graced me and said, I'm going to run the race with these people over here. And with all of you people too. And we encourage each other. And when we start to wander and we start to lag and we start to lose hope or courage or our way, we encourage each other. And we help each other to fix our eyes on Jesus. What important and privileged work that is that we walk together and we journey together and we run together and we encourage each other and we run a faithful race. That helps us, doesn't it? And when someone lags behind, come on, I'll run with you. 
You can do it. And that's what we do this week. That's what we do this week. We run the race. We follow Jesus. We fix our eyes on Him. The one who blazed the way before us and opened the way to heaven. And we see how He ran. With joy. With heart. With faithfulness. And we see how He completed the race and even declares it. It is finished. That's what we do this week. We rethink what strength is and we run with perseverance the race marked out for us, even when it's difficult, even when we're distracted. We persevere. This is all about finishing the race. Not just starting strong, not just running in the middle of it, but finishing the race. And God gives us each other so that we can finish the race, the one marked out for us. And so he says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So that we finish the race. So that we get to go to him. So that we get to stand around the throne and wave our palm branches in victory because it's Christ's victory which is our victory. This is what we do this week. We rethink re real strength today. Strength that follows the course. Strength that is focused. Strength that avoids hindrances. Strength that perseveres. Jesus had real strength. May he give it to you too as you run the race marked out for you. Amen. Would you please stand? And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. In response to the word and the encouragement of our Savior Jesus, let's confess our faith in him. We'll use the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join in our response of prayer. Dear Father, thank you for sending your Son and paving the way for our lives to be set free from through Jesus' death on the cross. Thank you for what this day stands for, the beginning of Holy Week, the start of a journey towards the power of the cross, the victory of the resurrection, and the rich truth that Jesus truly is our King of Kings. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We give you praise and honor for your ways are righteous and true. We offer you worship for you are holy and just. We will declare that your love stands firm forever. For your loving kindness endures forever. Thank you that your ways are far greater than our ways. Your thoughts far deeper than our thoughts. Thank you that you had a plan to redeem. Thank you that you make all things new. Thank you that your face is towards the righteous and you hear our prayers and know our hearts. Help us to stay strong and true to you. Lord, we ask for your healing and help to all those who are feeling alone or afraid or in need of help. Especially we remember Marion Flitter, Pastor Flitter's mother who just underwent knee surgery. 
Lord, be with Marian and reassure her of your love and your kindness. We ask that you use the surgeon and caregivers to restore her to health and that the rehab that comes next, that you'll use that too, Lord, for her good and for her blessing. Especially, Lord, not only do we ask for these physical blessings according to your will, but we'd also ask that spiritually you would give her real strength, help her to continue to run, help her to know that she's encouraged and cared for by the saints here who lift her up in prayer for all those who care for you. And more importantly, Lord, let her know that you care for her and that you are with her, even in difficult times. Watch over your people and bring your presence, your promises, your power, and your peace. Help all those in need to know that you love them and you are in control. Praise you. We, bless, we praise you. We bless you, Lord. Thank you that you reign supreme and we are more than conquerors through the gift of Christ. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. And in his name we also pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We'll remain standing as we close with our final hymn. Please be seated for a few announcements. Um, we did extend calls uh, this last week to Chris Avery as our principal uh, and Jean Avery as a 75% teacher. Uh, they are aware of their calls. Uh, and so we'd ask that you'd pray for their family uh, as they begin their deliberations. Uh, once again, the, the St. John St. James quilters have some quilts out in the, um, the back of church. If you want to take a look at that, some of you have already taken some. Whoever would like one, please take one and enjoy them. That's their hope. Uh, family devotions, we're continuing our um, family, uh, Families of the Bible Bible study today. And along with that devotions, there's some in the back. There's also some in the commons. And then if you've signed up for Easter breakfast and helping donating some food, you are asked to bring that uh, after the Good Friday services and leave that in the... 
uh, kitchen in the commons, uh, or uh, Saturday morning, I think they um, are opening up at 10 o'clock, or by 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. So if you can help um, bring those things that you've helped uh, or offered to help donate, uh, bring it by 10 a.m. on Saturday. Uh, we've started Holy Week, as you heard today. Uh, and so just a reminder and an invitation to you all and to those that you might know, uh, we'd love to have you join us on Monday, Thursday at 6.30. That service will have communion and will offer common cup, just a, similar, not just as, but similar to the way that our Lord Jesus celebrated uh, on Monday, Thursday. Good Friday, uh, 3.30 and 6.30, same service. There'll be a service of darkness or tenebrae at the 6.30. Uh, and then there'll be communion at both those services. And then Easter Sunday, 6 a.m., 7 o'clock breakfast, 8 and 10, 15 will be the same service, a festival service with, with Lord's Supper as well. We'd love to have you come for any and all of those services. God be with you uh, as we run the race marked out for us with perseverance. God be with you this week.